Good morning, Heritage Bible Church. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. Would you stand as we hear from the word of the Lord? Psalm 33 says, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. And then Psalm 34 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Run. 
my body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you.
joy and privilege it is to be gathered together and unite in worship. And part of the worship that we want to do is, yes, singing, but it's, it's so much more than that. It's the rich uh, fellowship time that comes with us. And, and part of that is, uh, part of our act of worship is uplifting those uh, in our body that we know are in need. And so if you have those connection cards, you want to fill those out. We'd love to pray for those, but I want to uh, pray this morning for the, for the uh, offering, but also for some of those body needs. And so many of you may, may know that uh, we were praying for Lisa Campbell, whose father recently passed away. She... Uh, this last week was also diagnosed with cancer, and so we want to lift her up with prayer as well uh, within our own body here uh, for Dwight as he uh, is transitioning after the loss of his son, uh, and for Cynthia who uh, recently lost uh, a family member as well. And so saints, join me uh, in prayer this morning for those needs. God, we come before you and everything that we have uh, this morning is an act of worship, God, and so may the songs that we sing reflect the status of our hearts, God, or maybe it's the, the desired status. Uh, maybe we're struggling this morning, uh, and yet, God, you are faithful in that, and you meet us in that, and so as we enter in and we sing, God, may your spirit be here, may it be real, God, may it be something that, that we feel, God, that, that transforms our life. And God, we are aware of those uh, in our body who are, are struggling with loss, with, with transitions, with questions, God, with uncertainty. And so, God, we think of, of Lisa uh, as she continues to mourn the loss of her own father, God, but their family is in transition with her recent di no, diagnosis. And so, God, would you be with her uh, and the family as well? God, we think of, of Dwight as he is mourning the loss of a son, God, of, of a friend, uh, Thank you for his faithful ministry, God, uh, the way that you have shaped and called uh, Dwight. God, would you just continue to pour out your spirit on him in abundance and blessing. And God, for Cynthia, as we think of her recent loss, God, as well, that uh, may you, the God of all comfort, be there with her. God, as we give now in another act of worship through our offerings, God, through the gifts, through the financial and material blessings that you have given us, God, take this and use it. Multiply it, God, that, that the good news that we have should not be stopped here, should not be contained here, but God, we want it to go out into the world. And so may this next act of worship, God, bring glory to your name as well. In Jesus' name, amen.
and over again, Lord. So, Lord, we want to take right now a time of confession. Lord, we confess where we have not trusted you this week. Start a reliving that same battle. So, Lord, right now I want to pray for all addictions that are going on right now. so hard to get stuck in our own flesh, that we have this on our souls, that we are freed people. And God, you give us the tools with your Holy Spirit to cast those away from us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now to tear down the walls in our hearts where we have built up. forgiveness, Lord, empower us to first come to you, the Father, full of mercy and grace, abundant in grace, that we may be known as a people that are forgiven. We don't live out of fear of what is due to us. Amen. Thank you, worship team. What a great promise. We're fighting a battle we've already won. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Our king has already won. We celebrate that. I want to share with you uh, one other prayer request. I know Justin shared several with you. Um, Friday morning, Annette and I went out for breakfast. We were making our way uh, back to this side of town, and we received a couple of texts letting us know that Sonny Grady had fallen and, and broken some uh, wrist and was at KMC. And so as we were driving, we, we pulled into KMC, and uh, I went up there, and I was waiting outside her room while nurses were caring for her. And then they wheeled Sonny out. So I just I greeted her as they wheeled her out because they were going to go run some tests. And uh, uh, she had broken both wrists and an arm, and then I found out today she's also scheduled for uh, our heart surgery. So we need to be praying for her during her recovery, things like that. Um, and so I just wanted to share that with you on top of other prayer needs. And then uh, Annette and I go out to the parking lot, and um, we get, get in our car. And we're, we're parked at the far end because every parking spot is taken. And as we're driving away there, fortunately, uh, there is a man out there who's also parked uh, near the, almost on, you know, parking, uh, almost next to uh, Mount Vernon, and he's waving us and telling us to stop, and he says, you've got a flat tire over here, um, and sure enough, uh, as I'm looking for a, par a, gr a great parking place at KMC and cannot find any, I drive in, I, uh, 
drive over a couple of nails that puncture my whole my tire. Have you ever heard the saying that when you check the air pressure in your tires, you should also check the air pressure in your spare? <laughs> that, that lesson really sank home. Uh, because uh, at first I thought I could, I could drive to Les Schwab, be okay. So we drove to one end of the parking lot, and Annette looked out and said, no, we're almost on the rim. You know, so I pulled in. Uh, together, she and I were able to, to get the jack out, uh, put, the, put the spare on. Uh, we lowered it, realized that the spare was almost completely flat. Not quite, but it had enough air to get us to Les Schwab, and so we were able to, to get there. Uh, you know, so that, that was just a wonderful experience uh, on our day off. But most importantly, we just need to be praying for, for Sunny during that time. Uh, and then uh, just want to remind you, next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and we will be celebrating communion. The week after that is Easter. We celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection. We're, we're excited about that. Um, and hopefully you may be thinking and praying about who you could invite. Inviting people to church can sometimes be challenging if they're not used to coming to church. And we want you to encourage you to, to think and pray about that. And so we want to show you just a, a brief video that talks about uh, some of the, the challenge and joy of uh, inviting uh, someone to church on Easter. Oh, come on. That's not a foul. Oh, wings are ready. Hey, uh, let, me, let me ask you something real quick. Yeah. Go ahead and have a seat. Okay. Hey, um, asking for a friend. What would a person's general thought be about scheduling or doing something on, 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 a, on a Sunday? Well, I think, uh, generally speaking, most people like their Sundays to themselves. But asking for a friend, yeah. what if there was something special about the Sunday, generally speaking? Generally speaking, they have to be really special. There ain't like a, like a showstopper. Right, right, right. So what if someone was raised from the dead. I mean, would, would that be showstopper enough? Well, it's bigger than being dead and then or being dead. Right? Right? Yeah. What, what if said person was the son of God? Kill him. And the miraculous act is through him he could save you from save your... Save you from your life. Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. Do you think a friend would like to go to something like that on a Sunday morning if invited? I'll tell your friend that uh, if he doesn't invite somebody to that, he's probably not really a friend. Right. Right? Right. 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 Hey. I'm the friend. It was me the whole time. <laughs> and then the Oscar goes to Meryl Streep. I love her. <laughs> okay, so think and pray about who you can uh, invite that day. That's going to be a, a Easter morning is going to be a great day. We're going to start uh, with a, a brunch at 8.30. We'll do our worship service at 9.30. Uh, one highlight of, of Easter morning is we're going to be baptizing a number of children. I'll be talking about classes for that. We may be baptizing 10 or 15 children that morning. And so we're excited about that. That'll be immediately following the worship service. And then children will have an Easter egg hunt out in the courtyard. And so we're excited about that. There'll be a number of I'm sure uh, you know, with a lot of children being baptized, there'll be a lot of relatives who want to show up and see that. So it's going to be a great event, and it'll be a name tag Sunday, which is always one of my favorite Sundays, and it is yours too, uh, as you get to know other people. I want to pray for our children as they are preparing to go to HK, to Heritage Kids. So God, we just lift up our children now, and I just pray that... that uh, 
you would open their hearts and minds to what you want them to learn this morning. We pray that they would be receptive. I pray you'd, you would speak through Victoria, who is leading HK this morning, and may her words just uh, ring true in sharing the gospel and the good news of your love and mercy for each of us. We thank you for that in Christ's name. So at this time, let me invite all, the, all of the children up through sixth grade to go with Miss Victoria to HK. And as the children are making their way out, okay, so as they're almost all out. As they're all out, let me encourage all of you to stand, greet two or three people you have not yet greeted this morning, okay? That's an assignment for everyone. Go ahead. Let me encourage you to go ahead and, and find a seat as we continue worship. And one, one quick announcement, if you didn't have a chance to greet Robert Solis during greeting time and wish him a happy birthday, you can do that following the service during fellowship time. Uh, just to let people know, Robert can celebrate with you. The last few weeks, we've asked church members to respond to a recommendation to the church body regarding Randy Steinert, uh, and we elders are recommending him to serve as an elder, and uh, out of all of the responses that came in, I'm happy to report that it was unanimous in affirmation of Randy as elder once again. He has served in that ministry before, so we're excited about that. And so we want to pray for Randy. So Randy, if you would come forward, and I want to invite elders to come forward. We just want to pray for him. Uh, 
and officially affirm him as he starts his ministry. Uh, let's just, I'm going to have you stand right there. We will gather around him. I've asked a couple of elders to pray. Roger is going to begin. Roger has a, a verse or two he wants to share before he leads in prayer. And then Chad's going to pray too. So join us as we, as we pray together. In uh, Philippians chapter 2 at the end, Paul is thanking uh, Epaphroditus for coming, and he has some good words about him. So I'm going to borrow those words to say about Randy. And he says, um, you're my brother, and Randy is a brother. He is a brother in Christ, and I'm pleased to know that his tender heart is always there with affection for the Lord. He's my fellow worker, and he works hard. You don't always see him, but he's working hard in the back, working behind the scenes, as well as Dolores doing things that uh, really further this congregation. A fellow soldier, he's in the fight, he's in the battle, he's the sharp end of the stick, as you say sometimes, uh, fighting and moving ahead to do things. Your messenger, the message of his life is the love for Jesus Christ in his heart. That's where his heart really is. A minister to my needs. He ministered to my needs and to the needs of the congregation in tremendous ways. That's what he said about Epaphroditus. And finally, verse 29 says, Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. So we want to do that today. Well, let's pray. Lord, it's a blessing to have <clears throat> Randy as a brother, a soldier, a fellow worker, someone who loves you and desires to see you move forward in the lives of men as he does move forward in Randy's life. Uh, day by day, he's drawn closer to you and knows you and cares about what you want and pursues that with all of his might. And we just pray your blessing on him as an elder. Oh, my Father, just praise you and thank you that Randy has, has stepped up and uh, come in to be an elder, Lord Jesus. And thank you for his affirmation of this and uh, just just getting to know Randy over the last several years and how much he loves you and his wisdom has helped me tremendously and he's just going to be a huge blessing to the school board, or, sorry, wrong board, to the elder board. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Father, thank you for Randy for his uh, heart to God that uh, is geared towards you. God, and as he keeps his eye uh, and his heart and his mind on greater things, we are thankful that, that uh, he gets to share that wisdom and that perspective with us. And so, God, is, uh, he is continuing to desire to, to run that race well. God, would you continue to guide and protect him, God, uh, as uh, you lead him, may he so lead this church, God, in, in faithfulness and in love and in service. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Y'all set that back up. Let me just make three, three or four uh, brief announcements before we uh, look into God's word this morning. Uh, I mentioned that on Easter we're looking forward to baptizing a number of children. Uh, and in preparation for that, I'm leading a baptism class for children. So parents, if you think your children are prepared, if they have a, a general understanding of what baptism means and why we do it, uh, and they have an understanding of their story of uh, faith in Jesus, uh, then they're invited to come to the baptism class. I'm leading that uh, this morning in the social hall from 11 to 12. I will be leading that next Sunday, same time, 11 to 12. And then there's a handful of, of students uh, who want to be baptized, but they're uh, busy with sports and other activities on Sundays. Uh, and then, you know, Easter vacation is coming. And so I'm doing another class the day before Easter uh, on Saturday, March 30th. Uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon. And I already know of five children that are coming Saturday afternoon. And so uh, if there's other children that can't make uh, today or next Sunday, but can be there on that Saturday, uh, they're welcome to, to join us here at church at four o'clock. So that's baptism class the next few weeks. Uh, men's breakfast, last Saturday of, of March, March 30th. Uh, I'm ordering breakfast burritos that day uh, from... Uh, delicious John's Burgers, some of the best breakfast burritos in town. Uh, I need to know if you're coming, so I order enough 
and uh, I already have a, uh, two or three people who have signed up. Let me know if other men are wanting to come, and I'll make sure we have enough uh, food for everybody. Uh, in your bulletin, one la last announcement. Um, there's an insert about men's camp out occurring April, 2nd, April 12th through the 14th. We're excited about that. That's up going to be in Havilah. Uh, it's a Friday through Sunday. That's up near Lake Isabella. Uh, elders are encouraging men to, to do this. We're doing this instead of going up to uh, man camp at Heartland. And when you went to man camp at Heartland, they served you more food than you could possibly eat. They offered you more activities than you could possibly do. It was a lot more expensive. We decided to take a different approach. So we're doing a camp out. Uh, Luxury camping, whatever the lodging you want to sleep in, uh, that is your choice. You want to be in a tent, you want to be in a, a trailer, an RV, you want to sleep in your car, it's perfectly, it, that is up to you. Uh, we will have indoor uh, restrooms because you can open the door to a porta potty and step inside. Uh, it is, it's rather rustic, okay? Um, but it's $95, it's, it, start, it covers dinner from Friday night until Sunday breakfast. Uh, we're gonna be doing a, a lot of different activities. There's gonna be shooting going on, shooting targets, doing some clay shooting. Um, we're gonna have a golf tournament up here. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I came up with the idea for a golf tournament and all you have to do is bring a nine iron, that's it. We'll supply golf ball. Nine iron is the only club you need. Even if you don't know how to play, bring a nine iron. It will be exciting. Uh, but there's going to be other games. Mike told me to bring bocce ball and cornhole. We'll sit around the campfire. It's going to be a time of just building relationships. I will be leading a couple Bible studies based in John 15, talking about how we can be fruitful for our family. Okay? So there will be some serious times. Um, and so that's April 12th through the 14th. Uh, men, uh, a couple ways. You know, if, if We need to know if you're coming so people who are preparing the food can prepare for that. There is a sign-up sheet on the, at the information booth. Uh, a few of you have indicated you're, you want to come, but sign up there. Uh, another thing you can do, you, you can go to our website, you can sign up and you can pay because the net has revised uh, the church website. And if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Uh, but so you can go on the website and sign up and, and pay for that. Um, so, uh, we hope that you have a number of men up there. It's going to be a great time, a relaxing time, and, and fun. And uh, so we look forward to that. Okay? So that's uh, in about four weeks for that. Let's go ahead, and we're going to continue our series. Uh, we're going to look at the we're going to look at the subject of wisdom this morning as we continue our study in the book of James, which we began uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and to begin with that, I want to share a personal story. Many of you know, uh, I became a, a full-time pastor a few months after finishing seminary, and I began as a full-time associate pastor at a church in Fresno, and interestingly enough, I served, the senior pastor I served with was Louis Paul Lehman, who had been a senior pastor here at Heritage uh, back in the 60s and 70s. It was during the time when, when the Lehmans were serving here as pastor, they helped, they were part of the group that helped start Ready Land Preschool, which then led to Heritage Christian Schools. So it was during their ministry when, when the school started. Uh, so I, I served with Louis Paul Lehman after about three years, he and his wife moved to Michigan, and the church uh, we were serving at asked me to be the senior pastor, um, and I agreed, and they gave us a vote of affirmation for that. I was 28 years old at the time. I'd, I had begun uh, being a full-time pastor when I was 25. Now that I was at a ripe old age of 28, they had asked me to be the senior pastor. I said yes, they said yes, and people... People in town thought I was crazy. I was the only pastor at a church of 400 people. At the time, that's just the way it, it worked out. And all the, for some strange reason, I became pastor, and a lot of people in church wanted to go to heaven. This church would do two or three funerals a year, 
And I was used to that. I became senior pastor, and people just wanted to go to hell. I did 12 funerals the first seven months. Uh, it was crazy. Um, a few years before that, the church had considered wanting to, to relocate or at least buy property as an investment. So the church had bought 23 acres on the edge of town, but had not decided whether that was going to be the property we would, we would eventually relocate to. Eventually we did, but um, you know that, that was still up in the air when I became the senior pastor. Uh, and during this whole time, there was, a, there was a one church member stood up in a church business meeting. He announced that he was a prophet and told us that if we relocated, God would, would remove the Holy Spirit from our congregation. Okay? Uh, we eventually uh, relocated and uh, we removed him from membership. But uh, uh, there was no short of, ex of excitement in that church. Uh, and being 28, I was too young and dumb to, to really know what uh, was, <laughs> was going on. Um, but I remember, one thing I remember very clearly is, is that the very first month I was the senior pastor, I shared this, the, this following story with the congregation. And, and I may have shared it with you before. It's one of my favorite stories because it, it, it really illustrated what I was feeling in many ways as I stepped into that uh, full-time position. And here was the story I told the church. My first month as pastor. I'd read about a 32-year-old man who suddenly was appointed to be president of the bank that he served at. And he didn't know that was coming. That was completely unexpected. Uh, he was surprised. He was shocked. He was very honored. Uh, but he felt overwhelmed when he considered all of those responsibilities. Um, he had never been a bank president before. And, and so he went, he went to the, the chairman of the board to ask for advice and, and say, hey, I, I just was appointed president of the bank, can you give me advice so that I can succeed in, in my job? And this older chairman of the board thought for a moment, how to succeed? He said, making right decisions. And the young man sat there and said, yeah, that's really helpful and I appreciate that. Um, can you tell me, what's the best way for me to make right decisions? And the chairman thought, he said, experience. The young man said, so that's just my problem. I don't have a lot of experience. I want to succeed. I want to make right decisions. What's the best way for me to, to gain experience so that I can do this? The old man thought for a moment and said, <clears throat> wrong decisions. And I shared that story with the congregation when I became senior pastor. And I let them, I wanted to let them know that for me being 28 and stepping into that role, I was young, I was going to make some mistakes, and they accepted that. They were patient with me as I learned, as I made mistakes. It was a great marriage ministry of, of us working together. They were very patient. They were very encouraging. They were very supportive. I ended up serving as senior pastor in that church for 12 years and still have a number of uh, friends uh, from that congregation. Thousands of years ago, there was a young man who was stepping into the role of replacing his father as king of Israel. Solomon was called to replace his father, King David. And right when, when Solomon prepared to take over that responsibility, God spoke to him and said, you can, you can ask anything for me and I will give it to you as you begin your kingship. And Solomon thought of all the things he could ask for. He thought of, you know, uh, wealth and, and success and pleasures. And instead of that, he decided, no, I need to... He prayed and asked God for wisdom. I need wisdom to lead all of these people, lead this entire nation. I need your wisdom and, and discernment to be the leader you want me to be. And God honored that, gave him wisdom, met that need. And as a result of Solomon praying for wisdom, God blessed him with success and wealth and pleasures. As we continue our study in, in James, we're going to 
look at a message entitled Walk the Way of Wisdom. There's a sermon outline in your bulletin if you want to take notes. This, the sermon outline is also on the church app. Some of you like to, to follow along on the church app. There's discussion questions on the back to apply the lesson. If you want to look at that during the week, we have a small group that does that uh, following the service. Wisdom is different than knowledge. When you think of knowledge, knowledge is acquiring information. It's acquiring truth and, and uh, facts. Wisdom, on the other hand, is applying that truth. So wisdom is taking knowledge, putting it into practice. If someone said, you can't learn anything new if you think you know it all. And that's why when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. When you think about that, knowledge, when you think of knowledge, knowledge puts the focus on ourselves, on information that we know. Maybe people notice the facts that we're able to recite. So love puts the focus on ourselves. Knowledge is, puts the focus on ourselves. Love puts the focus on other people. When you're loving other people, you're thinking about meeting their needs. It's an outward focus. And James gives us clues to help us learn if someone is acting in wisdom. So I encourage you to take a Bible or there's a, there's a blue Bible in front of you underneath the, the chair in front of you if you want to take that. Some of you can use your phone to look up scripture. Turn with me to James chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 13 to 18. And if you don't want to do any of that, the verses will be up on the screen. So you have many options. Follow along as I start reading James 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. James reminds us that wisdom is really shown by our lifestyle and how we live. And Jesus said the same thing when he was talking with his disciples about how they could detect a false prophet. He made the comment, you will, you will by their fruit, you will recognize them. Paul also wrote to the Galatians describing that a truly godly life is shown by the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is simply God's, God's nature and character that is displayed through us and, and in our lives. Je Jesus also told his disciples, you know, people will know you are followers of mine if you love one another. And when you think of all those verses and those teachings, it's our character. Our character always speaks louder than the content of our words. It's our character and lifestyle that, that people remember. Listen to this quote that I found on, on character, and, and it's not up on the screen, so you need to listen closely. It's rather long. But listen to this. Character, character is what you do when you think nobody is watching you. It's how you treat people who can do absolutely nothing for you. How you behave during the petty aggravations of everyday life. How you react when the pressure is on. And deciding beforehand you're going to do the right thing. It's those acts of character that really make an impact in our world and in our society. James then goes on in this passage to compare godly wisdom with earthly wisdom. And that the latter wisdom, which really isn't wisdom when you think about it, that wisdom, that mindset, that worldview is really from the devil. One quality of uh, this wisdom is, you know, people who, who cling to that type of wisdom 
often will boast about it or, or deny the truth. Uh, and that distortion is understandable when you consider the source of that wisdom. We know that Satan's nature is to lie and deceive. One of his goals is to deceive us by making sin appear attractive, convincing us that if we do that, there will be no consequences. One reason for that is that sin is easier to rationalize when sin is pleasurable. It's hard to sometimes say no. James then talks about people who, who live with bitter envy and selfish ambition. It's interesting. The Greek word for, for envy in that verse is pronounced zelos, uh, which is the Greek word from which we get our word zeal. And often when you think of zeal, zeal can be positive because zeal can, can represent someone who has passion. I remember uh, weeks ago when Randy stood up and, and shared his testimony, and it was just filled with passion and zeal. And that was exciting to, to hear, and, and all of you, you know, affirmed his, his role as elder. Uh, and a lot of that is his commitment and, and his passion. But the, when James uses zealous in, in this passage, he's referring to bitter jealousy that, that harbors hard feelings toward other people. Uh, you keep a bitter attitude toward, toward people. A few weeks ago, we looked at the topic of, of anger that James addresses in chapter 1. Uh, and we looked at Paul's advice in Ephesians 4, um, where Paul uh, writes in Ephesians 4 and says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil a foothold. When one nurses their anger, so much so that it, that it turns into a grudge, instead of releasing it with God's power, um, when somebody clings to that grudge, it, it opens their life to allow Satan to, to have a foothold in their life. People who are hurt often feel justified replaying a perceived injustice, which feeds their anger. And what, what many of them don't realize is that that allows satanic forces to control that part of their life. Uh, but in their anger, in their hatred, in their bitterness, it, it just distorts things and, and convinces them that uh, that's correct. And, and really only prayer that, that claims power and authority over unclean spirits is able to help a person find victory uh, in that part of their life. The result of, of envy and selfishness, according to verse 17, is that there is disorder in every evil practice. And that occurs Sometimes in home, at work, and sadly, even in the church. People who do look out for, uh, only for their own interests often don't want others to get ahead. Um, and uh, one author I read about, Charles Allen, was writing about a friend who's a fisherman and was talking about fishermen who, who uh, fish for crabs. Uh, so a, a crab fisherman, as they, as they are collecting crabs will, will throw them into a basket and a crab fisherman never has to put a lid on top of the, the basket. This fisherman was explaining to, to Charles Allen, you know, if there's ever a crab wanting to climb out of the, the basket and he starts climbing up the side, other crabs will reach up and pull him back down. You know? Uh, so nobody ever gets out of the basket. And when you think about it, there are too many people who act like that with other people seeing others get ahead and, and look for ways to, to pull them down. So wisdom is revealed by how we act. Wisdom is also revealed by how we relate to others. And James' point is that wisdom is a lifestyle. Wisdom may have nothing to do with your intelligence. Someone said knowledge comes from education, but wisdom comes from God. It said if you want knowledge, look around. If you want wisdom, look up. That's why Proverbs 1 verse 7 says the beginning of, or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And as I read through this, the list of characteristics and character traits in, in verse 17 of James 3 reminded me a lot of the fruit of the Spirit in uh, 
as it's described in Galatians 5. But look with me again at, at verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And so when, when James says in the first line there, uh, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all, what he means is, he, as he begins listing all these traits, he says, what is first in terms of what is most important, and then he refers to purity. Um, and I thought of that, and it reminded me of, of Jesus' beatitude in Matthew 5, verse 8, when Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And it's purity that then leads to peace-loving, the second characteristic. Peace-loving is to have uh, peace in, in your relationships. And that reminded me of the next beatitude in Matthew 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. <coughs> the third characteristic in this list in verse 17 is considerate. And that's the same word for gentleness, which is described in Galatians 5 as part of the fruit of the Spirit. How you and I get along with people is the real measure of how wise you and I are. For example, listen to this quote by George Washington Carver. Uh, you can look at it on the screen. He said, how far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and strong. Because someday in life, you will have been all of these. There's some wise advice there. John Maxwell, former pastor and, and now author, consultant, defines leadership simply as, as influence. He often teaches that to be an effective leader means that a leader must motivate, encourage, uh, persuade, and inspire. And so as, as Solomon is thinking about beginning his kingship, beginning his, his reign as king, of Israel. His leadership would depend very much on relational skills because that's what leadership really, leadership comes down to, you know, your effectiveness in relational skills. I often tell people, you know, having a position doesn't mean you're a leader. If you serve on a certain board, that doesn't mean you're a leader. Um, you're a leader if you're influencing people. And you're really only an effective leader if people are following you. That's why Benjamin Hooks, centuries ago, made this comment. Um, he who thinketh he leadeth and hath no one following him is only taking a walk. <laughs> you're not a leader because somebody says you are. Or you got elected to the board, now you're a leader. Who are you influencing? Who's following you? Who are you persuading? That's what it means to, to lead. And to lead well is to have wisdom. So how does one obtain wisdom? Well, James tells us that at the beginning of his letter. Uh, look at James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So when you think about wisdom, prayer is the key to wisdom which leads to the fruit of the Spirit. As Galatians 5.16 says, as we, uh, as we walk by the Spirit. Really, if you want to live like Christ, you need to abide in Christ. I was talking with Annette. We went out to breakfast Friday before we ended up at KMC and got to change our tire. But while we, while we were at breakfast, I was explaining to her, my quiet time, my quiet time Time with the Lord, for me personally, has changed in 2024. In the past, and I've mentioned this before, in the past I would focus on, on reading uh, various books of the Bible. Uh, and really as I thought about that, uh, wanting to, to read you know, many books of the Bible, my focus 
was really on knowledge, gaining knowledge, and, and uh, Tina related to, to ministry. But as I started this year, God led me to just focus on the Gospel of John. And I've mentioned this before. He said, Jim, I want you to just uh, read through the Gospel of John and, and reread over and over. Uh, and so for the last two and a half months, I've just been reading the Gospel of John. I think I'm, I'm in the fifth time of reading Gospel of John. Um, and it's been very meaningful. God led me to, to memorize the first half of John 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and talks about abiding and what it means to bear fruit. Um, and so every morning, I'm reciting the first half of, of John 15. And as a result, you know, one thing is that prayer has become a bigger priority for me, uh, partly for a couple reasons. One is Annette and I are, are going through uh, EHS a second time, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, which uh, is being led by Pastor Justin Hebert. Uh, I, I tried going, it through, going through it uh, a year ago, but with my own sickness and my mom being in the hospital, I was only able to attend a few sessions. Now I've been able to attend all the sessions, and, and prayer is a key part of having emotionally healthy spirituality. But also, uh, Annette and I have attended a number of prayer schools with, with VMTC, sort of the abbreviation for Victorious Ministry Through Christ. Um, and it just things that we've learned through BMTC is, is before we sit down and, and pray with somebody, and, and maybe we'll spend a couple hours praying for individuals, before we do that, we prepare our hearts and minds for prayer. And we're very intentional about that. And so we take time and, and we, we declare the Christ's lordship in our lives. We claim confession, uh, victory, uh, we claim uh, gifts of the spirit, we uh, claim unity, we, we pray for authority over unclean spirits. And, and so I've been praying through that uh, every morning as I begin my day, uh, praying through those. And then I pray for God to, to fill me with his spirit. I pray through all the, the fruit of the spirit, you know, those nine characteristics listed in Galatians 5. I then pray through the armor of God six pieces of armor listed in, in Ephesians 6. And then, then I open scripture and, and I start reading through scripture. And um, I want to tell you, I have discovered prayer is helping me to abide more in Jesus than Bible reading I've done in the past. It's something I also have discovered, and I, I probably preach this, but I haven't practiced it until recently. I confess that. But by spending concentrated time in prayer, really connecting with God, making sure that my mind and my heart are right with God in all those ways that I've prayed. That has enhanced my scripture reading. I spend several minutes just making sure I'm, I'm praying and, and connected with God. And then when I open the word, it's like he begins to reveal things uh, that I haven't seen before uh, in, in passages that I'm very familiar with. Nikki Gumbel, the director of Alpha, uh, makes the comment, says that, that prayer is the most important activity in a Christian life. And we watched that this last week, last Wednesday on, on video, and that was very encouraging, and, and I could relate to that. So in James 3, James asked the question, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility. The reality is that it is humbling to have to rely on God in prayer. Sometimes I've been guilty of wanting to focus on Bible reading so much, and, and to be honest, I'm, I'm sort of proud of my information and knowledge. But prayer is a humbling experience because you come before the Creator and confess our need for Him and His wisdom and understanding. But as we are willing to turn to God in prayer and in humility, it's God who, who generously pours out wisdom so that we can learn, that we can lead, we can love. So let me ask you the, the hard question. When you, when you see James comparing different types of 
wisdom. Which wisdom characterizes your life? When people look at your life, do they see purity and peace, wisdom from heaven? Or do they see bitterness and selfishness from time to time? Godly wisdom comes through prayer. It is shown in humility. The result is a life that visibly displays the fruit of the Spirit and displays one who is abiding in Christ. May that be the goal for each of us as we seek after the Lord, seek first his kingdom in our life. Let me invite the worship team to come up as we prepare for one final song. Join me in prayer. Father, James tells us that if we lack wisdom, that we simply need to pray and ask you for it. Lord, may we not be guilty of relying on our own knowledge and resources and strength and insight. May we be men and women who, who humbly look to you for our life, for our direction, the breath we breathe, the life we live, choices we make. God, I pray that as we recognize our dependence on you, that, that we would allow your care, the power of your spirit to flow through us in fruit and in gifts, that uh, as we learn to abide in you, that you would be producing the fruit in our lives that reflects you. You said, my true disciples produce much fruit and this brings great glory to my Father. Lord, it's our desire that our lives truly glorify you through the fruit you produce uh, in and through our lives that you would be honored. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let me invite you to, to uh, stand as we sing our uh, final song together. Uh, as you stand, if you've taken a moment to fill out a connection card, uh, feel free to pass those in. And ushers will pick those up. Let's sing together our final song.
Amen. Let's go ahead and recite together 2 Corinthians 3.18 as our benediction, which we've been doing each Sunday at the end of the series in James. Uh, let's say this together. And we all, with unveiled face, continually seen as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are progressively being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to even more glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. May that be your experience this day and coming week. God bless you. You're dismissed for fellowship in the social hall.